Good morning, everyone. It is the first day of November. Hard to believe 2020 just continues to move on. But we're here. We know some of you are not able to be here for health purposes, um, but we, or maybe you're away, but we're th certainly thankful that you're here with us today. One thing I want to make mention of as we get ready to start today is on Tuesday, we look at that as a day of, of the election for the United States, but we as a church are also going to take this as a day for prayer and fasting, and we want everyone who can do that to join us, and, and maybe it's a food fast, maybe it's food and media, that probably wouldn't be a bad idea as well, but we are not praying and fasting for a candidate. We are praying that God is in control of this election, that God's will will be done, that we trust whatever happens, that we trust God, um, no matter what, what the results may be. We're going to pray and fast for unity and peace in our nation and also in our churches. This has become such an issue that we need to make sure that we are praying for our own unification as a people. We're going to pray for revival for this nation, for God's kingdom to truly make its way and invade this world, as we'll talk a little bit about this morning. And we're going to pray for the hearts of our worldly leaders. No matter who they may be, no matter what side of the aisle they'll be on, we're going to pray for those folks. So I think that's important. But today we're going to Matthew chapter 6, and we're dealing with prayer. Last week, Jesus talked about these, these hypocritical religious leaders, and he gives three examples where they had done their, they had practiced their righteousness to be admired by others, to, for other people to look at them in a special way. And one of those examples was prayer. And after it, Jesus gives what we often call the Lord's Prayer. But really, it's the disciples' prayer. He begins in verse 9 and he says, and pray then like this. Well, what does he mean by that? I think he meant that we were to pray this prayer. <laughs> I believe that was the intent. Imagine what Jesus is offering us here. We are getting into the very process of how Jesus prays. He is giving us a gift. He's not giving us a lecture. And what's beautiful about all of this is that Matthew, he centers the Lord's Prayer right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's the center not only structurally, but also theologically as well. So we're going to begin this morning, and if you want to join me in, in saying this prayer, then join me. But here's the prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into, into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. There are two main sections that you will see in your Bible with this, this text. He says the first part, there are three things that are stated, and he says, your, speaking of the Father, your, your, your. And then he moves into the communal aspect of the believers in Christ, and he says, us, three times, us, us, and us. It is a rhythmic poem. It is filled with literary and artistic structure that makes it easy to memorize. I believe that was the intent. And so, here it is. It's centered upon Jesus' teaching, as you're going to see, as Jesus will eventually teach the two greatest commands, which is to love God with everything we have, and then to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Let's look in the first aspect here of loving God. Jesus gives these three petitions to tell us who God is and also the concerns of the Father. And the first one is, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed means holy, set apart, unique. And he's letting us know that in our world today, that his name is not being made holy. 
that his name has not been treated as unique in this world. And so Jesus brings the kingdom in order to restore God's name, to restore his reputation. I mean, we look in our world today. We look in the nations of the world, and we we look over the years, and, and we see people who belittle those who believe in God. They they believe those who believe in the Creator of the heavens and the earth. They think that this is some kind of fable. Our God is is con- called a warmonger, a homophobic, a, a misogynist, uh, all kinds of fancy other words to describe our God in a very negative way, and His. And even in the highest offices in, in of this land and other lands, we have heard people who discount those who believe in God. His name has been mistreated. It has been misunderstood. His image-bearing people, based on Genesis 126, we've fallen off the rails. Jesus has come into our world to set things right through this movement. And so he says, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Jesus' message was very simple when he began preaching back in chapter 4. In verse 17, he says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's here. It's, It's about to break through. Who are the crowds? These are the people who are first being offered who have been offered the kingdom of God. These are people who are changing their lives, turning from their own lifestyle, and they are turning to the way that Jesus is teaching them. The whole basis of the Sermon on the Mount is to say, this is the kingdom teaching. This is what it's like. So the kingdom is breaking in. In the book of Ezekiel, it tells us of these divine visions of the reconstruction of our present world, of the restoring of humanity back to the days as it was in the Garden of Eden. At the time of Ezekiel, though, he's sitting in Babylon. He's sitting in exile, but he's given these visions. And when you get to to chapters 34 through 37, there is a promise that's given of a messianic king who comes from the seed of David. He will be a king that, that would be unlike any king that Israel had ever had, but they had needed and he's speaking of the coming of Jesus and the kingdom of God that he brings into our world. And it's within these promises we read these words. This is Ezekiel 36, 22 through 23. He says, It is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. And I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am Yahweh, declares the Lord God. How? He says, when through you I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. Through the coming of Jesus and his kingdom, God's name would be restored, it would be honored, it would be made holy throughout the nations. And this is our calling. We are to be more about advancing of the kingdom of God than we are of any of the kingdoms of this world. Hallowed be your name. Oh, it's beautiful. When God's name is being cast throughout our world, as the good news of Jesus Christ is making its way throughout our world. It's it's beautiful when we see God's name being made holy as, as people are doing these acts of kindness and missions of mercy in his name. It's beautiful when we see that in God's name, people are compassionate to those who are downtrodden. And so we pray, Father, help us, help us, to restore your holy name in our world. But then he says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's an interesting statement. Many think of heaven and earth as being two separate places and that Jesus has come to earth to get us out of here 
to take us to heaven. And there is some truth in this, but there is a distortion among, among this as well. Because this in Genesis 1 and 2, heaven and earth, they are completely together. They are one big unification. They are in perfect harmony with God. But in chapter 3, we see what happens. They fail. And because of the failure of humanity, they are cast out of that garden. They are taken into a place um, that is outside of the presence of God. But what we see is that it didn't drive God out of our world. We don't have time, but we could, we could look and see how God's presence was still holding on in our world. The kingdom of heaven, folks, it is God's movement. It is an invasion of the kingdom of God and for God's presence to come into our world and to take it over once again. Folks, that's the story of Jesus. How does Revelation end? It ends in Revelation 21 verse 10 through the symbol of Jerusalem. He says that heaven comes down and it joins earth once again. There is this final completion when heaven and earth are once again restored. Creation is restored according to Romans chapter 8 and verse 21. Humanity is restored as you read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, especially verses 51 and 52. Has the kingdom come? The, the answer to that is yes. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It has come. But the question is, has it permeated every inch of our world? And the answer to that is not yet. Not yet. The kingdom lives in his disciples as we are filled with the, his very spirit of God. The kingdom is here. And those who are not a part of this kingdom, one day we're going to be pushed out. They will not be in the presence of God. They will have their own place. So we are to pray daily for more and more of heaven to take over the earth, for more of God's kingdom to take over our own lives, more of our lives, because that, folks, is what God is about. So now we look at loving your neighbor. Only after we orient ourselves in the first part of this prayer can we move to loving your neighbor as you love yourself. The first thing he teaches us is to pray, give us this day our daily bread. Now notice he says us. He doesn't say me. Why does he do that? Well, I believe that what he's saying is this is to be a communal prayer. This is something we are to pray together as disciples of Jesus. He could have very easily said me, especially coming off of when he's talking about the hypocrisy of their prayers and they're outside and they're wanting to be seen. He tells them, go into a private place. Very easily, it would, or really naturally, he could have said here to pray me, but he says, pray us. Now he says, give us this day our daily bread. Can you think of a time when the community of God's people prayed daily or relied daily on God's bread. Manna in the wilderness, right? This story is between the time of Israel being delivered from slavery of sin to the promised land that they would be given a rest as they would finally come into that land. And they are in this in-between stage, relying upon God daily for those provisions. I absolutely believe that was intentional. As we have been delivered from our slavery to sin, and we are waiting for the great promise of a new heavens and the new earth. <clears throat> and here we are, we are in the middle, we are in our wilderness, and we are to rely upon God every day. In this period, we are tempted to believe that we are the ones in charge, that it's our money. We work hard. We can do with it whatever we want. We become attached to it. And so we're tempted to think everything that we have is because of us. 
Jesus says, or what I believe Jesus is saying here, is that the mindset of every disciple of Jesus is that we are is is that we are provi- we are relying upon God for our daily provisions. Now there were many in the crowds who who did absolutely do that, but I believe He's talking to all of us, no matter where we are in life. And, and that we are to see ourselves and put ourselves in the mindset of a day laborer or, or a beggar, if you will, who sees their daily bread as a gift that is not to be taken for granted. To view our food and clothing, shelter, our family, relationships, community, all of these as a gift from the Father of lights. And by doing so, it changes how we think. It changes how we see things. The very first thing that happened in Acts chapter 2, when when Jesus now has ascended into heaven, the Holy Spirit has now come, is we see the disciples, they're sharing their stuff. If you were to read Acts 2, verses 44 through 45, they sold their extra and they gave to those who were in need. This kind of prayer, it it absolutely is about generosity. Everything we have uh, beyond our own necessities, it's a gift. We start thinking about others. And Jesus is really going to deal with this next week, so I'm not going to push it too far um, this week. But here, this is a prayer, our daily bread. And then he teaches us to pray. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Forgiveness is at the very heart of the kingdom of God. Jesus believes that we need to pray this prayer every day, that we have been forgiven, and then we go out and we forgive others. A fallen world expects its rights, doesn't it? it, it you know, we, we have this tendency to want to retaliate. But when heaven and earth meet... That's where the kingdom of God is present. And there we we give up those rights. We now center upon the cross. Jesus absorbed our sins and the consequences of our sins on the cross. He doesn't call down 10,000 angels to destroy the world, to get them back. Instead, he forgives them, even on the cross while he's dying. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But then he expects our forgiveness that we have received then to be be pushed out and invade our world and those that we come in contact with as well. And it's not easy, is it? It could be that guy that's, you know, your next door neighbor and kind of a jerk. It could be the person that works with you in your office and they've, they've tried to sabotage you in some way. Maybe it's a family member that's taken advantage of you and, you know, you're just so sick and tired of those things. But it could even be something much more serious. It could be someone who's responsible for the death of someone that you love. Maybe it was a pedophile or maybe it was a rapist. And it doesn't mean that when we forgive them that we become best friends with them, we hang out with them. No, 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 no. We're talking about releasing them from your life. Release them. And in order for us to do that, we've got to pray for God's strength and power to forgive. Then he taught us to pray and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Was Jesus ever tempted? Was he ever led to be tempted? Well, sure. And back in chapter 4, Jesus is led into the wilderness for 40 days. How long was Israel in the wilderness? They were there for 40 years. Folks, this is is all connecting. It's, It's all intended to be here in a certain way. He was tested for his loyalty and his allegiance to the Father. Would he choose to take the kingdom by force, or would he take the kingdom as the suffering servant of God? He is tested again in Gethsemane. He didn't want to go to the cross, but he 
but he totally surrendered himself to the Father. To be a part of the kingdom of heaven, we can expect opposition. We can expect that it's difficult, that we too, we have been delivered from our slavery to our sinfulness, and we're still awaiting the coming of the promised land. But in here, in the wilderness, we are tested. We will choose the way of God, or we will choose our own path. And it's going to be hard. In fact, it's described as spiritual warfare in Ephesians chapter 6. And one of the great weapons that we are given in that warfare, also in Ephesians 6, is prayer. Pray this prayer. Pray, our Father, to lead us not into, into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Jesus has given us this condensed version of a daily prayer of the disciple. It is to inspire us to live every day for God and the kingdom of God. This morning after worship, we're going to be giving out these little cards. You can put them in your, your billfold or you can put them in your car or wherever it is. And it just has the disciples' prayer on one side and the other side, it is the prayer itself because we believe it's important. Jesus believed that it's important. In fact, let's say it again. Our Father, who, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive our debts as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Amen. Jesus knew praying to forgive others was going to be so difficult that he comes back and he ends this way in Matthew 6, 14 and 15. He says, For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Jesus says that if you are unwilling to forgive others, it's showing that you have not internalized the grace and forgiveness that has been given to you. For Jesus, the number one sign that the grace of God has been sunk into our hearts is by receiving forgiveness and then in turn giving it back out to others. Perhaps this is the reason we were intended to come together as a body of people to partake of the Lord's Supper, to share in this supper together as we remember the forgiveness and what it took for us to have forgiveness as also we forgive others. In Matthew 26, Jesus goes on to say he took bread and he blessed it, he he gave thanks to, uh, to uh, gave it to the disciples. He said, take, eat, this is my body. He took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he said to them, drink all of it, all of you, for this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And I just wonder, are there people maybe that it's a part of this church that you need to forgive? Maybe there's um, maybe there's someone else out there, there that you need to forgive. There may even be people out there that has begged you for forgiveness, but you know, they've just hurt you so badly, too badly, you think. In Ephesians 4.32, Paul says, Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. How does God forgiving you which is your sinfulness against the holy name of God. How does it compare to what someone who is a sinner has committed against you, who, by the way, is also a sinner? The Lord's Supper, as we have come, we're going to come together this morning, we circle around this table of fellowship, and we celebrate God's mercy and grace with one another. And maybe it's something you need to do. Maybe you need to even be here with us 
in this fellowship as, as we commune together and thank God for our forgiveness and then release others who have, who have sinned against us. Let's pray. Dear Father, we love you so much. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. Father, this prayer can sometimes be difficult, although it seems so simplistic. But Father, let it touch our hearts. Let it touch our minds in every way. Help, Father, that it reach the, the depths of every essence of who we are. Father, we, we come to you and we just beg of you of your forgiveness, of your love. And Father, we beg for your son to come again. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.